Hey everyone, welcome back to Cody's Lab. So I had a pretty crazy idea, possibly crazy enough to save the world, or just crazy. But either way, I'm sure you guys will get plenty of edutainment out of it. <laughs> As may be given away by the title, my crazy idea is to use meteorite, rocks from space, as a fertilizer. Now my definition of a fertilizer is something that a living thing needs in order to grow, and if it doesn't have it, and you give it to it, then it'll grow better, right? So what in a meteorite is a living thing going to want? Now to explain this, I'm going to have to uh, first tell you what living things need in order to grow, at least life as we know it. So of the 90 or so chemical elements, different types of atoms that were forged in stars and spread around by supernova, 23 are needed for life. The vast majority, the bulk, 95% are made up of just four elements, and those are hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. If you have a pie chart showing the mass of the elements in your body, the four elements here would make up everything but a little sliver. 95% of your mass is just these four elements. And that makes sense because these elements are very common in the universe. They are some of the most common elements and they're chemically very interesting. Helium is more common than oxygen, for instance, but it doesn't react, so it's not here. In terms of fertilizer, you would add these elements if they're lacking. So if it's dry, you would add hydrogen and oxygen in the form of water. You know, watering plants in a desert does make them grow better. If you are lacking carbon, say if you're growing inside of a greenhouse or something that uh, is sealed from the outside air, then you would pump in carbon dioxide from another source. You know, there's 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but uh, you could increase that. And for nitrogen, nitrogen is the one we most often see used as a fertilizer. Nitrogen makes up 70% of the atmosphere, but it's the wrong form. You need to combine it with other elements to make something like ammonia, which plants can use. And you would only do that if the soil bacteria that normally fix nitrogen from the atmosphere was lacking somehow. Either you killed it off or you just want to grow crops at an amazing rate, such as with our modern industrial agriculture. So are these elements found in meteorites? Yes, there are certainly plenty of oxygen in the form of silicates. But this particular rock doesn't have very much hydrogen, nitrogen, or carbon because those elements form volatile compounds which easily evaporate, and this rock was formed at a fairly high temperature, and so they've already boiled off. There are certainly meteorites that contain more of those elements. Carbonaceous chondrite comes to mind. And there's certainly those elements in comets and uh, shadowed craters on the moon, and those will be very prime targets when we colonize space because we'll want those elements and we'll want good sources of those elements. But for now though, meteorite is not going to be a source of those. But we do still have plenty of elements left to list. So the next group of elements, the majority of the remaining wedge, four and a half percent of your mass, is made up of these elements. Calcium, sodium, Phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, sulfur, and chlorine. These elements are primarily your electrolytes. They are commonly found dissolved in water and are what plants crave. <laughs> They help uh, with uh, moving nutrients and electrical signals around the body, in and out of cells. Uh, calcium, in vertebrates at least, is used to strengthen our bodies. But if you're a gardener, you'll also know that calcium is needed to prevent uh, blossom end rot in fruit. So you would add a soluble form of calcium to the soil if that is occurring. 
sodium and chlorine, of course, salt. Usually you don't have to add this because there's just so much of it around. Magnesium and sulfur can be added with Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate. Phosphorus, I have some uh, potassium phosphate. And potassium, of course, any potassium compound. This has to be potassium nitrate, which also adds lots of nitrogen. The elements most commonly used as a fertilizer, though, are right here. The NPK. That's the three numbers you see on many fertilizer bags. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And those are most commonly needed in terrestrial agriculture because they're used in such quantity by plants and they're so easily depleted from the soil. So does a meteorite contain these elements? Yes, it does. This is a rock and those are rock forming elements. The thing is though, the earth is a rock too. These elements are super abundant in soil and they're highly soluble. So they're also abundant in the oceans. In order to get enough phosphorus and potassium, you know, there's only about 1% of the weight of that meteorite are those elements. You would have to add a lot of it, like a half inch thick layer to your field. And that's just too much to ship down from space. If you did that on a large area of the earth, the amount of heat you would generate as those rocks fell from space would probably set the earth on fire. So these elements, we're not going to be shipping those in from space anytime soon. So then that leaves the last little sliver, one half of 1% of your body weight, which is your trace elements. So you have iron, which makes up the part of the hemoglobin in your blood. If you needed that, you would use a, a soluble iron source like this ferrous sulfate. Iodine, which is used by your thyroid to help regulate hormones. You'd use uh, sodium iodide for that. Fluorine, which you know helps strengthen your teeth and also used in your bones. Got some calcium fluoride for that. Chrome, which in humans is used to regulate insulin. We have some chromium chloride for that. Silicon, which is used in your bones, also the shells of many animals. Got some amorphous silica. The rest of them, I forget what they do, but you have boron, which I can add in the form of boric acid. Uh, zinc. Got some zinc sulfate. Vanadium, I have ammonium vanadiate. Cobalt, I've got some cobalt chloride. Manganese, some manganese sulfate. Copper, right there, copper sulfate. Molybdenum, some uh, sodium molybdenate. And selenium, sodium selenate. So these are your trace elements right there. And this is the list of elements necessary for life. Uh, I will mention that this is specific to humans. Uh, if you're some microbe that doesn't have bones or teeth, then you might not need fluorine. Uh, if you are a horseshoe crab, you use copper in your blood instead of iron. But iron is still used for other things, such as the uh, processing of nitrogen. In fact, most of these elements have more than one use. There is also a few uh, substitutions. Uh, strontium, for instance, replaces calcium in most cases because strontium is so chemically similar to calcium. Uh, bromine can also replace chlorine. I don't know if you could replace all of the bromine, all of the chlorine and calcium with those elements, but I know you can do a lot of it. But back to these trace elements, they are absolutely necessary for life, but only needed in very small amounts, which is fortunate because they are only available in small amounts on the Earth's surface. Now there's a few reasons for that. First, fluorine and silicon, they're just very insoluble. They form very hard minerals, which are hard to break down and so they're just not fairly available, even though they're quite abundant. 
uh, iodine and boron, I think. I'm actually not sure about boron. Maybe you can tell me in the comments. They are just very rare in general. Like iodine is super rare in the universe because it's just such a heavy element. It's, it's hard to form. The rest of these elements, uh, maybe not selenium, are not abundantly available for two reasons. The first is that they're easily oxidized by our oxidizing atmosphere to a form which is not useful. So take this uh, trace element concentrated solution that I made a few months ago for use in fertilizer. You can see an orange film is developing on the inside of the plastic. Now this is mostly the iron converting from the plus two to the plus three oxidation state as it reacts with a little bit of air that's trapped in the bottle. And when it does so, it becomes insoluble and precipitates out of solution. And this actually happened in the Earth's oceans back during the great oxidation event when cyanobacteria started using photosynthesis to produce uh, food and oxygen. The iron and some of the other elements in the ocean became oxidized, they precipitated out of solution, forming the banded iron deposits, which us humans are currently using as one of our major sources of iron ore. Now there's ways to prevent this. Uh, first would be to keep the solution acidic so that uh, the plus the lower oxidation states are more favorable. And also to use uh, chelating agents, which uh, grab onto the ions and protect them from oxidation. So many times you'll see iron sold as iron chelate for that purpose. You can have a soil that is 20% iron by weight, but if that iron is in the form of magnetite, your plants can still be iron deficient. Are these elements found in a meteorite? Yes, they are. In fact, iron makes up almost 20% the weight of this particular rock. And most importantly, those elements are in the lower oxidation states, which are useful for life. So it's good to go. But the biggest reason that those trace elements are not available on the Earth's surface is because they're not on the Earth's surface. When the Earth formed, it was hot, it was molten. And so those elements, the iron, the copper, the cobalt, the chrome, they sunk down and formed the Earth's core. And so our thousands of miles away from where life is and are therefore unreachable. The meteorite, however, never fully melted, so that element separation never occurred. Everything is still fully mixed in its original abundance. This means that the meteorite should make an excellent source of trace elements. I could use it instead of my trace element solution. Earth rocks do contain these elements, not nearly as much as the meteorite, but they are there. So as long as you have new rocks breaking down, particularly igneous rocks, or bacteria in the soil that are able to reduce those elements to a form that is useful, or it's just not super alkaline, then those trace elements are usually not the limiting factor. It's usually something else. There's, there's plenty of those elements there for life to use. But if you're out in the ocean, things are a little different. So now those elements dissolving out of the rock will get used up by life, or they'll be oxidized very close to shore. And if there's not enough bacteria there to uh, re-dissolve it, then it ends up just settling in the ocean floor. And so if you're out to sea, really the main source of these elements is what blows off of land and the dust that settles in the ocean. But if you're really far from land or near land that's covered in ice and there's not a lot of upwelling from the ocean floor, and you can have large patches of the ocean, which are dead zones, which are the deserts, really, that have very little life. Even if the other elements like nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus are in abundance, a little bit of iron in this case would do a lot of good. <laughs> Perhaps we could do this by dropping the trace elements from space. This would increase the biological activity out in the parts of the ocean which are normally barren. This will pull extra carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And over time, maybe some of these 
uh, organisms would die and sink down to the ocean floor, where they'd be sequestered forever. Perhaps this could save the world by getting that CO2 out of the atmosphere and stopping global warming. The question, though, is, you know, there's more elements than just the ones that are needed for life here. You know, there's platinum and gold and many others. So maybe something in the meteorite is toxic. Maybe I really shouldn't be holding this in my bare hands. I don't think that's the case because if you think about it, most of those elements that we have came to the Earth after the Earth's surface solidified in the form of meteorites. But maybe the Earth has detoxified it over time. Maybe if we add a whole bunch of meteorite, it's going to be a problem. So let's grind some up and find out. So here's a closer look at the meteorite. This is a specimen that fell over Northwest Africa and was collected several years ago. As you can see, it's been cut to give us a better view of the inside. And if I zoom in, you can see these little round grains. Those are the chondrules. Those are rock that condensed as liquid droplets from the solar nebula as the sun and the earth were forming. They stuck together to form this rock and have been unchanged since. They're four and a half billion years old. And if I tilt it just right, you might be able to see there's little flecks of iron in there as well. It's actually metallic iron. And I think that's really cool. This is like a snapshot of the material that the Earth is made out of, completely unchanged. Of course, it is changed a little bit. You can see there's some bits of corrosion here and here. Uh, this specimen has not been super well looked after. In fact, my finger oils are not doing it any favors. But uh, you know, gloves are getting expensive nowadays. But it's not going to hurt it too much for my needs. Uh, I will go clean this anyway, just in case there's anything like in the cutting fluid. You know, I'll just, just eliminate that possibility. But uh, I wanted to have you guys look at it before I go clean it up. Yeah. All right. Oh, wow. Look how nice it looks when it's wet. Isn't that pretty? <laughs> Okay, so it's cleaned up a little bit. I'm just going to knock off a little piece. There we go. Let's uh, throw these in the pesto and mortar. Let's grind them up. Go fine powder. dust. Now I need some algae. Okay, so this is what I've come up with. I've got four two liter plastic bottles. You can see I've got them labeled, they're cleaned up. And down here I've weighed out all of the bulk nutrients. So this is potassium nitrate, sodium chloride, uh, ammonium phosphate, magnesium sulfate, calcium chloride, and a little bit of sodium bicarbonate has a pH buffer. Uh, here's my algae, which I've left in the window for a few days. You can see it's, it's growing very nicely. I don't know what kind of algae this is, I call it the tank algae. It's just stuff that grows in the water tanks. It's very tenacious and it does respond well to nutrients. So that's what we'll be using. We've got some distilled water here. Let's uh, put this nutrients in the water and we'll add an equal amount to each of the bottles. There we are. Let's actually this up a little bit. That does it. It's no longer distilled water. Okay. So, 
so you can see better. Got the same amount of solution in each. And now I'm going to take the meteorite dust, which I've weighed out into two equal samples of 65 milligrams each. I'm going to put it into the two center bottles. Dust. Two meteorite dust. Perfect. Now these two bottles over here, you see I've got uh, trace written on them. I'm going to add a little bit of the trace element solution. So this has got the correct proportions of iron, copper, manganese, zinc, molybdenum, etc. So I'm just going to add uh, two milliliters of this solution to each of these two bottles. Trace elements are now in those two solutions. I'm going to seed each of the bottles with a sample of this tank algae. Got me a clean syringe here. Just going to do three milliliters in each. Sounds about right. I don't want to introduce a whole lot of nutrients. Uh, the nutrients came from dead bugs that landed in the tank. <laughs> so we'll only have three milliliters of that, which hopefully the algae will use up very quickly. There we are. Okay. Now I'll top these off with water. There we go. I'll add the caps with the airline tubing. Okay, airlines are all hooked up. Turn on the lights. There we go. Come back in a week and see how it's doing. If the meteorite dust is a good fertilizer, the last three of these will probably end up a bright green. Uh, if it's a poison, then the middle two should be less green. You guys get the idea. See you guys in a while. So results time. They've been bubbling away for a little over a week, and you can already see that the last three bottles on the end here are a nice dark green color indicating that the algae is very healthy. But this bottle over here on the end is a pale yellowish green color. Now any gardener would know that this is what you see in plants when they're deficient in iron. Because that's exactly what's happened here. The algae is mineral deficient and so it's having a hard time. There's a little bit of minerals uh, in the algae and possibly in contaminants in the uh, other fertilizers I had, but it's clearly not enough to support much biomass. And actually on that, if I turn this light on again, you can see that the meteorite dust one is actually darker than the others. This indicates that it has more biomass. There's more algae cells in there to stop the light. Now, there's a few things that could cause that. Uh, perhaps maybe the algae doesn't like the trace mineral solution that I added. That would lower its productivity slightly. Or, with what I think it is, uh, you notice that the level in the last two bottles there is lower than the ones over here. That means that more evaporation has occurred. And I think what's happened is these pumps are not you know, identical. You know, they're the same brand and everything, but you know, I'm sure there's some variation. 
and so perhaps this one's gotten more air gone through it so it's had more co2 more algae growth so a quick test on that hypothesis was to top off all the water to the same level i switched a couple of the air lines and then i let it bubble away for another few days and you can see the water level on this one is still the lowest like if it was just that this air pump was putting out more air you would expect this one to now be lower but that's not the case also, if you look at it right on the edge, you can see all three of these now have less water than this one. So this tells me that what happened is the algae did grow better. It became darker, it absorbed more light, made the water slightly warmer, and increased the evaporation rate. And now since they're all dark, they're all on the end here evaporating more than this one. So, maybe it is that the meteorite dust was a superior fertilizer than my trace element solution. Perhaps I messed up somewhere and had a little bit too much selenium and that slowed down the growth slightly. Or maybe it's a statistical fluke. Maybe it just started off with more in the beginning, more growth in the beginning, and that made the solution warmer and that had a feedback cycle. It's hard to tell. It's a problem with these small end studies. It could just be a statistical fluke. But something that is clear is that the meteorite dust is a viable fertilizing medium. And that's exciting. <laughs> and I, I kind of want to eat some algae that grew with meteorite dust now. I don't think it would be any problem. I'm not going to eat this algae because I don't actually know what kind of algae this is. It could be harmful to me, but I do have some algae that I know I can eat. Let's uh, grind up a little bit more of the meteorite. Here's the spirulina that has grown with the meteorite dust. Let's pour it off into a filter so that we can collect the algae. Okay, the water's running through the filter. Most of the algae is getting caught. And now most of the water's run through. Let's scrape the algae up off the filter. There we are. Algae using meteorite dust as the trace element nutrient source. Let's give it a taste test. Okay. A little bit salty. I've neglected to rinse out the, uh, the nutrient solution, which has a lot of uh, sodium carbonate in it. But yeah, I, hmm, another problem. I just crunched on some grit. It's got a little bit of grit, and, uh, undissolved meteorite. <laughs> so... In hindsight, maybe it would have made sense to dissolve the meteorite in water and then run it through a filter to get the insoluble minerals removed. But other than that, I think it's perfectly edible. I don't see any problems. This, this could work. It's encouraging. So I guess the last question to answer is, is it even possible? Like, could we feasibly move enough material down from space to make a difference? The first thing I need to know to figure this out is how much of the trace elements, uh, particularly iron, because iron is needed in the most quantity. So I went to the store and I picked up some spirulina that was commercially grown, just so I can look at the uh, nutrition facts. And you might be able to see in there, iron. 1.5 milligrams per three gram serving. Now that is just how much this algae contains. Uh, the actual value, the minimum amount of iron needed to grow algae could be quite a bit less, but that does sort of give us an upper bound. And since algae, the uh, dry weight is about 50% carbon, that means that for every ton of iron we make available, we can pull a thousand tons of carbon out of the atmosphere. And that's pretty good leverage, that's a thousand to one. And it might even be better than that, it might be 10,000 to one. 
but uh, going off the upper bound, we'll just go with a thousand to one. Humans currently are putting into the atmosphere about 10 billion tons of carbon every year. So that means that we need, assuming the thousand to one, 10 million tons of available iron. That's, that's a bit. As I mentioned before, this particular meteorite is about 20% iron by weight. Some are more, some are less, but that's a pretty good value. Just makes the math easy. So that means that we would need 50 million tons of asteroid material dropped onto the Earth per year to offset humanity's carbon emissions. So asteroid Bennu, which uh, looks about like this, it's kind of an oblong spherical shape, weighs 73 million tons. So that amount of material is about what we have to move down from space every year. Uh, to put it in perspective, if I put the Empire State Building next to Bennu, it would be about yay big. So you know, it's skyscraper sized. Of course, it weighs a lot more than the skyscraper. Fortunately, there are thousands of asteroids in similar size and distance, so that's not a problem. There's plenty of material. We just got to go get it. Now, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft, which just went to Bennu and grabbed a sample, is going to cost $1.2 gigadollars. And it's going to get, a, like, a handful of material. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing you got to remember is that that was kind of like paying to design a car, design the factory to build parts for the car, assemble the car, uh, buy fuel, uh, plan out the route, pay somebody to drive the car across the country to pick up a package, drive back, and then shove the car into a chipper shredder. If instead of a little car, you had a big tractor trailer that could haul 20,000 packages and you weren't trashing it when you got back, you were recycling some things, uh, maybe going through a private uh, contractor to pay for a lot of the things, then the cost per package is significantly less. I think you could move a substantial amount of an asteroid for that amount of money. And also for every subsequent mission, it would cost less. So how much would it cost to get the iron from the Earth? Well, the cheapest source of iron that is in a usable form that I found is a ferrous sulfate hepahydrate, which is about 20% iron by weight. And that's about $200 a ton if you can buy it in large quantities. So at a minimum, it's going to be about $10 billion a year at current prices to fertilize the oceans enough to really make a difference. Now that doesn't actually sound that bad. I think we could do that. But what you have to remember is that we have to mine the iron, we have to mine the sulfur, combine them to make the ferrous sulfate, we have to transport it and distribute it around the world, and that's all going to create more greenhouse gases and more environmental damage. You launch a rocket, that's going to create environmental damage, but you might only have to do that a few times. And once you've got the infrastructure up there, it's no longer going to be putting stress on the Earth. But okay, it does sound pretty ambitious to move millions of tons of rock millions of miles through space. And it is. Maybe it's super complicated and it's going to be a really hard task to do. And really, energetically, it's not. The delta V, the change in velocity to go from an asteroid to the Earth, is tiny. Especially for the ones that cross paths with the Earth, of which there are thousands. In fact, if you were on one of these Earth-crossing asteroids and you picked up a rock and threw it at the right time, you could get that rock to intercept with the Earth maybe a few years later just with your own power. It's that easy. In fact, one idea I had was to use the asteroid's own rotation. You see, uh, in the case of asteroid Bennu, 
I keep using this asteroid because it's one we know most about. It's rotating so quickly that if you had a tower just 20 meters from the surface of the asteroid coming out from the equator and you dropped something from the top of that tower, it would not fall. The gravity is so low that at just that distance, the tangential velocity would be enough to be in orbit. It's like, that's so crazy. If you had the asteroid spinning just a little bit faster, material would actually fly off into space. And that's exactly what I'm proposing. If we had a long tether to facilitate this, you move material up, like on a little space elevator, once you got past about 20 meters, it would start pulling away on its own from the centrifugal force. And if you had this tether maybe several kilometers long, and the, the planes were aligned properly, you could release it at the right time and the right speed, it could, in theory, be sent all the way to the Earth, basically for free. It would slow down the rotation of the asteroid, and the more material you threw off, and that might actually be a desirable thing because that'll make mining it easier. So, there's loads of options. I think that if we do go the route of ocean fertilization, it will eventually make sense to bring the material down from space. Uh, first of all, because uh, mining the material from the Earth is only going to get more and more expensive, whereas the stuff from space is going to get only get cheaper. And the stuff in space will be a byproduct of extracting other valuable resources from the asteroids. We might end up just shipping the mining slag back to Earth that is otherwise useless. I imagine what we would do is have like large lightweight bags of material that we'd ship back from the asteroid and we'd open up the bag just before it got to the Earth, spread the material out a little bit, and the, the material would be like sand or small pebble-sized pieces that would completely burn up in the atmosphere. And can you imagine being on a cruise ship in the middle of the ocean at night when thousands of tons of meteors are being brought in? That would be fantastic. That'd be a, an amazing show. What would you pay to watch that happen? <laughs> now, there are plenty of problems with this idea. There's problems with ocean fertilization in general. Like if you create an algae bloom, it will consume the oxygen from the water and kill fish, which is a problem. I think that you could avoid that if you could spread the material out enough that you're just increasing the biological activity, you're not really creating a bloom, and you're doing it in an area where there's not a lot of biological activity to begin with and not a lot of fish. Now, the problem is going to be targeting it. You know, bringing the material in and hitting the right spot on the earth, that's actually not that hard. In fact, it might be a problem because the same technology could be used as a weapon. The problem is going to be the fine dust particles are going to be blown around in the atmosphere. Uh, I'm not an atmosphere scientist. I'm not sure what it would do. It seems like it would be bad to have that landing like on the ice caps or being breathed in. Uh, if it does drift off target and land in the Amazon rainforest, that wouldn't be bad because it would act as a fertilizer there but also if it lands in water that is already fairly biologically active, then of course it could cause an algae bloom. So yeah, there's more information that we need, but there it is. This is a possibility. I think it might just be crazy enough to work. Maybe you think it's crazy. Let me know in the comments. Hope you enjoyed. I'll see you next time.